we'll spend, I don't know, two-thirds of the period finishing up the chapter here, and then we'll have our top hat questions, 12 of them. Okay, so I'll give a couple more minutes to get some latecomers to show up before we do attendance. Don't let me forget, I did push the record button, so we're on, although it's kind of weird. I normally, see, I figure you have the PowerPoints, so I don't put those up in, I put those in the lower corner here, but Hmm. Today, the swap is the wide view, so no sense in having that, since you can't see, even see the board. So, anyway, back to the uh, PowerPoint-centric view of the record. All right, let's see. So we're going through the slides here, making sure that, that the mini rant from last time covered everything, and I think it did, but, uh, you know, repetition is good, and fishes for questions and all of that, so... Uh, just go through these points here. Okay, so by maximizing profit, a firm with a monopoly generates a dead weight loss. Okay, so why is that? Going back to the fundamentals. Okay, let's put some numbers on this just so we don't have to talk in terms of Q's and P's, which is, sounds kind of wacky when you talk about it that way. So let's see, this looks like about 400. Okay, and that looks about 300, so we'll go with that. Okay, for those of you way in the back, 300, 400, 500, 1,000, right? We know this is 500 if that's 1,000 over there because the marginal revenue always falls twice as fast as price. So it hits the uh, x-axis at half the quantity. That's that old marginal revenue shortcut. All right, and all firms, competitive or otherwise, monopolies, doesn't matter, find their profit-maximizing quantity where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. Memorize that, mm, well, I don't know, I guess. But knowing when to use it helps to understand what it means. That means the firm keeps producing more, which means having a lower price, right? They choose on the price, uh, I mean, on the demand line as a menu, the price quantity combination that maximizes profit. So each additional expansion only happens if they're willing to lower price, okay? So they keep expanding and lowering price as long as the additional revenue from increased sales, taking into account having to sell them cheaper, okay, that's why it goes down twice as fast as price, okay, as long as the additional sales add more to revenue than to cost, okay? It's that old uh, adage of economics is the painful elaboration of the obvious. Like at that point, once all the terms gel in your brain, it's like, duh, right? Sure, yeah, somebody out to maximize profit would just keep making more stuff as long as it added more to revenue than to cost, okay? That's all that hieroglyphics about Okay, shorthand there. That's all that hieroglyphics means. It means the business is gonna act in its own self-interest and keep producing until the marginal revenue is equal to or barely greater than marginal cost. Why barely greater to then? Well, because in some cases, you don't hit a point where they're exactly equal. You go from them, one being bigger than the other one, and then if you make one more, it's smaller than, well, where, which one do you pick, or where, where it's bigger? Okay, if you're making umbrellas, and the marginal revenue is more than marginal cost with the fifth umbrella, but the marginal revenue is less than the marginal cost with the sixth umbrella, you don't make a half an umbrella. Right? So avoid memorizing hieroglyphics. Okay? Think through it. So you can see at the end of the semester, your little mental Rolodex gets more and more crowded with things you're trying to remember and it keeps sorted out. If you don't understand them, by the time the end of the semester comes, you're going to be, over, you're going to be an overload and you won't remember the right thing at the right time and you'll crash in the final. And that always happens for some students. You know, they're on that river in Africa, you know, denial. Ah, all my other classes I've got to memorize. This can't possibly be any different. It's all worked all through high school. That's got to be what I've got to do is memorize. And it get, keeps getting harder and harder to produce decent, great results, and it never has produced any intellectual results. And that's because you're having it by the final exam, having to try to remember more and more things that you don't understand. As uh, Bob Newhart would say in the famous video, stop it! Google it, by the way. It's a funny video. Bob Newhart, comma, stop it. 
comma YouTube maybe would help also to find it. Stop it. Don't do that. It's counterproductive, or it's not, at least not productive. And it's easier sometimes on a regular exam, like the one you've got coming up in five days, to keep all the ducks in a row and to keep it all remembered straight. And you've all got a good measure now after two exams, if that's what you're doing, of how well that works. Okay, at least grade-wise. It doesn't work at all intellectual-wise. Okay, but on the final, you're going to have triple the amount to try to remember, if that's the way you approach it. No, disaster. Okay, a continuing intellectual disaster, and now even a grade disaster, a bigger one than usual. Okay, I see some more people have crept in, so before I uh, move on with more slides, why don't I move up here and uh, do the attendance thing, get that taken care of. Hurry, we're taking attendance. Uh. <coughs> Hurry, taking attendance. You can get in. You can still do it. One eight nine eight. Continue to trickle in. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I whip that cell phone out. Uh, see, that was raining the other day. Today the weather's perfect. But, oh, well. Going once, going twice, going, 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 going. Oh, sorry. See, we can't keep trickling it in there. All right. This is the trickle in. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, back to the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. All right. So, parting the jargon, getting past the uh, hieroglyphics, we have to try to think about what each of these items means. Okay. So, how do they generate a dead weight loss in the process of maximizing profit? Well, because they have to lower price to sell more stuff, or conversely, the way the monopoly looks at it, if they make less stuff, they can raise their prices. Okay, in that process, they back away from what would be the market equilibrium. Okay, the market equilibrium where the supply intersects demand, MC being supply. Okay, so the Q star 400, that would be if it was a competitive market. Okay, they back away from that, recognizing that now they can choose a price rather than having to be a price taker, that at least for a while as they back away and raise price and thus restrict output, profits go up. Okay, and in the process, they end up at a production level, Q with a little apostrophe, I call it Q prime, 300, in case you're in the back and you can't read the number. Okay, they end up at a quantity or price, which is the same as marginal benefit, Boy, so much more stuff to remember. Now, wait a minute, don't do that. Remember, I just said don't do that. What, why is price equal to marginal benefit? Why is it the same thing? Well, because we know you act in your own self-interest, and as long as it's worth more to you than the price you have to pay for it, to buy another one. Right? So we, right, we're looking at rational behavior. That's what economists do. We leave the irrational stuff to the psychologist. Okay? We look at what's purposeful, thoughtful, non-impulsive behavior and say, okay, what will people do when they think about what they're doing? They will keep purchasing a product until the last unit is just barely worth what they're charged for. Okay, so we know whatever the price is, that number is gonna be marginal benefit, and then we can compare that to marginal cost and say, ooh, wow, the monopoly is gonna stop at a quantity where price is way above marginal cost, marginal benefit way above marginal cost. That means additional output would be worth more to the consumers, to society, than the opportunity cost of making it. Bingo. Dead weight loss. By the way, if you're, if, if you're having a reaction of like, like this, like, okay, there he goes again, dead weight loss, yeah, there's more, right, marginal benefit, that's good. That means you're getting it. 
right? It should be kind of, you know, occasionally an eye-rolling thing where it's, yeah, the dead weight losses, they're all the same. There's nothing new about them. It's, they're identical in the way, I, way you figure them. Yes, in the externality chapter, there was dead weight losses by doing too much, right? Here it's doing too little, but it's the same concept. At the equilibrium, the result of people acting on their freedom at the equilibrium quantity, the gains at the margin, right, for one more at the margin, are not equal to the opportunity cost at the margin. Okay? So here we have too little in the externality chapter, we've had too much. Absent some policy that we could possibly implement. Okay? So from 300 to 400, the marginal benefit of making more would be more than the marginal cost of making more. So that's the, we're leaving it sitting on the table. Dead weight loss, right? There it is on the table, a stack of money, and we'll just leave, we'll just leave it there. Right? Additional gains from trade, just sitting there. And the externality chapter is we had it all sitting there and then we gave up some of it. Right? Some of it went away because we overdid it. You know, kind of like if you're at a party and you have a couple drinks, that's fine, and you're being sociable, and you have a couple more, and oops, that was too many. You gave away some of the good times by getting skunk drunk and you forgot who you met. And, what went on at the party, and hopefully you got a ride home with somebody. Okay, that's the externality idea. Yeah, we went up to the optimum point, the externality case, and then we went past it because the price didn't adequately signal what the opportunity cost was. There were external effects. Okay, in this case, we stopped short. Here in this chapter, chapter 13, we stopped short of the optimum because lacking competition a single firm had an incentive to restrict quantity to raise price. Okay. Nothing new, but you know, I may have said it differently, hopefully better. Hopefully in a way, if it didn't light the light bulb the first time, it did this time. But nothing new or different really about it other than in the book. Fishing for questions. Okay, so we could implement government regulation to uh, do something about this dead weight loss. I'm going to lay the shaded in here. Well, let's go ahead and stick some numbers over here on, so we can figure out what it is. Because that's the way that I separate as much as I can on the exam, those who memorize and those who know, put some numbers up to it and say, figure out something. Okay, so let's see, let's make these some nice round numbers. Okay, and then this would be All right, so let's see. Test yourself, as it says on some of the slides. The dead weight loss per year is? Okay, the 100th unit, not the 100, the 300th unit. Q prime is 300. at a value to the buyer of $35, at an opportunity cost to society of $20. All right, so we shouldn't have stopped. From society's perspective, full speed ahead, go. Well, now Monopoly says, society, oh well. I'm not society, I run this business. I'm at my profit maximizing point. If I make more, I give up more by lowering the price than I get by selling more. Not gonna do it. Okay, so we lose from the 300 of the first one, slightly less than 35 minus slightly more than uh, 20. It's sitting on the table. We leave it sitting there by not producing the 300 of the first one, and so on for 302 and up to 400. Okay, the dead weight loss is what? 750. That's what you got, right? And it feel good to be able to get it first, not to be told what it is and write it down and wonder where on earth it came from. Okay, so the dead weight loss there is 750. How do you find it? Okay, so you start off with the loss where it's worst, right, 15, 30 minus 20, and you converge on where the loss goes away, zero, right? So the average between 15 and zero is seven and a half. So the average loss for these 100 units is seven and a half. Okay, and you think, oh, it's just a triangle. Yeah, okay, sure, that's, yeah, that's a triangle. 
base times the highest divided by two. What's the economics of it? The average loss to society from going to 300, or not going from 300 all the way to 400, is the average of this loss and that loss, 15 and zero, okay, seven and a half times 100. Maybe that helped. Hopefully it did. No. Oh, write the whole thing down. The average loss over the 100 units is seven and a half, because the loss on the first one is 35 minus 20. See, from from not going to 300 to 301, you lose this difference. Right? No. Marginal benefit. Gain to society from making one more is 35. The loss to society for making one more is 20. Okay, so by not doing so, we forego, lose $15. But the losses shrink down to zero when you get to 400. So the average of 15 and zero is seven and a half. 15 plus zero divided by two is seven and a half. Okay, and then that's the average for 100 units. Okay, now, see, I'm a little uncomfortable with that because, say your first name. Priscilla. Yeah, see, you didn't get it the first time, and I don't think I explained it any different the second time. That's why I'm trying to get you to say what part of it you don't get so I can figure out some different way to say it. But I don't think I said it the second time any different than the first time. So I, I don't think I'm serving you there very well in doing that. Tell me more about what part of that I didn't compute. Maybe you'll do that for me. At the equilibrium, and that's the base of the triangle. Multiplied by the Q prime, or the Q prime. Exactly. Q prime minus the Q prime. Yeah, the difference between where you are and where you should be. Yeah, all headway losses are those two things, and then that's why I did the average things. You got to divide by two. What's the economics of the dividing by two? I mean, it's, yeah, it's a triangle. The economics of it, what we're all here to learn, is the loss converges to zero, shrinks to zero once you get to the 400 in this case. And see, the loss gets smaller and smaller the closer to the optimum we go. The loss in this case being what you have foregone by not going further. Right? In the externality case, it's an actual loss in that you had it and you, you, you lost it. Here the loss is it's sitting on the table waiting for you to grab it and you leave it sitting there. That's a loss. Right? If, you're, if it's sitting there and you grab it and you don't, it's a loss. Maybe that's the part that's hard to facilitate. Say it again. Uh, uh, yeah, but see, okay, good. Because I'm glad we did our Sam Donald's thing and we kept out of there for a while. Okay, you see, that's what we mean by the optimum. Okay, marginal benefit to society equals marginal cost to society. That's why that's the optimal amount. We've squeezed all the gains from trade off that there are out of there when we get to 400 in this case. Right, by stopping at 300, the monopoly decides to stop at 300. We leave on the table those additional gains that we could have had by going all the way to four. Cool. See, persistence is a good thing. See, I know you're all naturally trained to some extent to, that people don't want to be pestered that you want to keep explaining. I want to be pestered to keep explaining things. I really do, right? Because it's all in the book. It's all in the PowerPoint slides. The reason, you know, for me to have a job to do this is to, as I keep saying, clarify. Right? So it isn't clear, you need to bug the heck out of me until it is clear. And it doesn't bug me in the least, quite the opposite. I get excited. And I see the light bulbs going, I can see the thumbs going up, I get excited. Father, get it, cool. Right? I'm, I'm having a positive impact today. Okay. Whereas this lecture with blank faces makes me think, why don't I just teach this online, you know, because they're not saying anything. Now I'm going to try that next semester. We'll see you know, that, see, the one thing about the online, I want to learn everybody's name next semester in the online version of this, because everybody has to participate. It's 20% of the grade. I should have made a mistake this semester not making it at least 5 or 6 or 7%. To, uh, uh, twist your arm to go online and put, post some stuff. Because, see, that's an engraving on your brain when you have to write out stuff that you think is right or isn't right or you know, somebody corrects it nicely. You know, then you can learn from that when you're just sitting passively watching something. Okay, so more questions to come. We don't have that much new material to go over today, hardly any, right? We just want to kind of be, to 
death, this stuff is sort of kind of shaky. So we're still on the first slide. Uh, okay, so government regulation, what do we mean? Okay, so the monopoly is making money hand over fist, right? Economic profit. Okay, well, what is the economic profit? Let's do that next. We'll have a chance to do that on the, on the, on the uh, uh, top hat stuff in a minute, too. So just repetition, as they say occasionally. We're going to be over the weekend for a conference. But I can think of it, it'll be fun. Okay, so profit. Okay, this isn't like marginal revenue equal marginal cost, right? It's not like that. Marginal revenue equal marginal, that's an objective. Okay, marginal revenue is an objective and you reach that objective by picking a particular quantity. This here, this is just a fact. This is just a definition, right? Profit is money left over. Total revenue minus total cost. If we factor the Q out of the TR and TC, then we get this. And this is useful for looking at this graph because it says, okay, so what quantity are they going to produce? Oh, 300. Okay, what price are they going to charge? Uh, 35. And when they produce 300, what's their average cost? Oh, 24. Right, if you're futzing around with basic math kind of stuff like that on the test, you're going to run out of time. Right, it isn't hard, but you have to do a couple of them just to kind of get yourself smoking along and doing things kind of quickly and smoothly and correctly. Okay, so let's see, what's 11 times 300? Not, don't divide by 2. See, here's where you get your brain scrambled by not knowing why you're doing what you're doing. This is not finding a deadweight loss where there's an average loss over some range of quantity. This is a, hey, how much did we collect per unit of sales? Sales of 300, $35. What was the average expense we incurred, including opportunity cost, for making those 300? 24. So we averaged $11 per unit that went out the door. 11 times 300, that's our, that's our uh, economic profit, right? The average cost includes opportunity cost. So we have money left over after meeting opportunity cost, we have an economic profit, 3,300. Okay, and unless there are barriers to entry, that's going to attract competitors, and the monopoly is going to be kaput, as they say in Germany, which means broken. And of course, that's part of the definition of a monopoly, is a business with no close substitutes, producing a product with no close substitutes, protected by barriers to entry. Otherwise, it's not a monopoly for very long. Right? If they're close substitutes, they have no monopoly power. And if there are barriers to entry and they start raking in the big bucks, they're going to see competitors. The monopoly's done. Okay? So no close substitutes, barriers to entry. Now the list that we had about you know, what creates monopolies, why do they exist, we'll have that again a few slides later as a summary. Let's see, control of a key input, innovation, economies of scale, government protection. I think that's where most monopolies come from. It doesn't say in your book. I don't think it says where most of them come from. But most monopolies that exist in the real world are the result of crony capitalism. Crony capitalism, that's where you have a buddy in the government that makes a law or laws that keep competitors away from your business. Okay, and so the economy is inefficient to the extent of these deadweight losses being all over the place. And that's only part of the picture, crony capitalism. To sustain these economic profits takes resources to, to uh, sustain. Right? Lobbyists aren't cheap. Okay? And you think the government, the crony capitalist government, creates your monopoly and keeps it for you for nothing? No, you gotta, you gotta ante up and support them. Okay? So first you're diverting skilled labor away from doing other good things into fighting over existing uh, markets. Now that's a cost. Okay? And then, uh, then you have the deadweight loss on top of that of not making enough of the products where the monopoly exists. That's why most of the poor people, or the most of the poor countries on earth are poor, corrupt. Right? They, 
max out on these dead weight losses. If you're going to whisper, you have to do it a little more quietly because otherwise you kind of distract me. Okay, now making profit does create some incentive and some room to innovate. So uh, the monopoly profits being earned sustainably are not without their social benefits. All right, so we could regulate the price, and we'll deal with that option a little bit further on when we look at natural monopoly, where we probably want to do that. But first of all, let's figure, let's look at a couple of other ways to address the monopoly situation. Patents are granted to inventors. Society has decided that the way to encourage innovation is to grant monopoly profit, which means to incur dead weight loss temporarily, right? A patent isn't forever, it expires, and then the competitors can come in. So what could we do instead of allowing somebody to, in effect, rip off everybody else for a period of several years? Here's some alternatives. Now, I apply your economics from the perspective of the government and maybe think of some reasons why they don't do it this way. In other words, why they grant patents allowing those with useful inventions to make monopoly profits for a while. What's true about these two that isn't true about granting a patent and allowing somebody to make a monopoly profit for a while? See, these are alternatives as a way to still incentivize uh, innovation, but without having that dead weight loss for 10, 15, 20 years, however long the patent lasts. I keep thinking there's 17 years and that may not be true anymore. Something in that neighborhood, I think it varies from one kind of product or one kind of patent to the next. But it's something in that neighborhood number of years that dead weight loss is incurred as a sort of a trade-off from society's perspective versus, hey, if we didn't do this, the product might not exist at all. If we do it, well, then we're going to suffer underproduction and higher prices and dead weight loss for a while. Okay, so these two things are an alternative to that. So what's true about these two that isn't true about blocking entry into a business for a while as a way to reward monopolies, or reward innovation? I think earlier in the semester we talked about the minimum wage versus having wage subsidies. What's the difference there? Same difference as this here. The minimum wage is what? Is a, it's an order, right? A mandate, a law you have to follow. Other than some cops to enforce it, there's no budgetary cost though. See, whereas this, and that wage subsidy back from several chapters ago, requires Congress to appropriate some money. Take money away from other things the government could be doing or borrowing more, going further into deficit and debt. Okay, so, the Congress is saying, I've got these other things to spend money on. Why don't we just reward monopolies by granting, I mean, reward inno innovation by granting monopolies? There is a possibly huge cost to society to do that, but no cost to the government budget to do that. See, there's the trade off there. The government officials are more incentivized to worry about the government budget, and we want them to worry about the government budget and not so much worried about the total cost to society that, they, that isn't as easy to calculate. Okay, so sometimes the nature of economic incentives within the government causes inefficient choices to be made because the cost can be externalized. So what do we mean by that? If we grant a patent, we're externalizing costs by saying, oh, the taxpayers are not going to bear these costs. All you consumers are going to bear it by having to pay some phenom possibly phenomenally high price for something. Whereas with, if it was competitive right away, we might not have to pay that. That example that's in your book on the, the, the drug, uh, Glaxo, Klein, Smith or whatever produces this drug, you know, it could be at that high price that they charge that a lot of people die, you know, because they can't buy it. Yeah, they do some things for poor people, but, you know, some people could fall through the cracks. Okay, so all the alternative would be to go out to uh, that company and buy up their patent, whatever it costs. Now, what's the comparison there? What's the patent buyout likely to cost? 
the present value of where my hand is, the economic profit, right? Present value. The present value of annual, of somebody annually expecting, right, per year, expecting to have this much money left over after opportunity cost. Okay, let's just, let's see, what is the number? 3,300. Okay, so to buy up this patent for this monopoly that we've got up here on the board, it would, somebody would have to figure out the net present value, or the present value of someone expecting to get $3,300 left over after opportunity cost every year. And there's a fairly easy way to figure out what that is approximately. Take the dollar amount and divide by the interest rate. And that tells you kind of sort of what that present value is. So let's see, let's just make an easy calculation. Say the interest rate was a phenomenal number that we're not used to, 10%. 3,300 divided by 10% is what? 3,330,000. I mean, sorry, 33,000. Okay, so if you paid this business $33,000, they would probably say, here's my patent. Here you go. Sold. If you paid them less than that, they'd say, no, nah, I think I'll keep my patent. No, thank you. I'd, I'll stick with being able to charge $35 uh, and having expenses of $24 and having $3,300 left over after opportunity cost. Okay, so the taxpayers would have to come up with the $33,000 to buy the patent from them. Okay, whereas the other way, consumers pay higher prices for a period of several years. Actually, in this case, given the patent example, the 33,000 is probably on the high side because the patent expires after a while. Right? If it was a non-expiring patent, yeah, 3,300 divided by the interest rate in this example, 33,000 uh, would, be, uh, would be about right for that. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, and then prizes, uh, you know, same thing, cost taxpayers money to grant these prizes and, you know, would, would create some kind of a bureaucracy to figure out what was worth granting what prize to. And uh, I'm kind of conservative politically, so I'm not sure the government's up to that kind of a calculation. But there it is. It's on the menu of options as a way to get that competition going sooner, you know, and it, depending on the product and the circumstances and the politics and all that, it might be... Uh, might be uh, cheaper. So, eliminating this by allowing competition costs the present value of this to taxpayers. Take a moment to write down what the this is. I'm pointing to stuff, right? Eliminating the dead weight loss sooner, right? Because the patent will eventually expire, will cost so another thing about these two options, it might not be worth it. Maybe the dead weight loss is small and the monopoly is huge. I mean, the monopoly profit is huge for whatever reason. It might not be worth the patent buyout cost to eliminate those dead weight losses sooner. Marginal benefit versus marginal cost to the taxpayer in this case. Yes. The dead weight loss? How much would what be? How much would? The dead weight loss was 7,500. Uh -huh. uh. So, how much would it cost if we eliminated it? Well, we'd have to pay the, uh, for the uh, patent buyout, we'd have to pay the present value of the $3,300 per year. Okay, so let, let, never minding that money has different values and different, you know, money 10 years from now is not worth the same as money now, right? Just because you can put money in the bank and earn interest. But if we just set that aside, let's say a patent lasts 20 years, and we think that, that $3,300 in 20 years is, has the same value as $3,300 handed to you right now. So 20 times 3,300 would be the cost of buying out that patent. Okay, and then that would eliminate the $750 dead weight loss every year. For, you know, see, right, that, that says, mm, that doesn't sound like very good economics. Okay. What does that do for you as a consumer, though? Well, it, it, it benefits the consumer of the product by, because it, it, let's see, if, if we got rid of the patent in this case, and therefore the monopoly, the price would fall to this level right here. Quantity would go up to 400, and the price would go to, say, 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we, if we buy out the patent, then, the, then pretty quickly, 
the uh, price would go to the competitive equilibrium price. Probably not, given the numbers that I concocted up there. Because it looks like the uh, cost of the buyout is not justified by the size of the deadweight loss. Okay, so it's a kind of a case by case thing, which is maybe why it makes sense just to grant the patent. Because see, there's some heavy duty math here, not to mention some politics and figuring out how to get these things to work. When should we buy the patent? When shouldn't we? How big should the prize be? Who should decide on what criteria? Is it transparent enough that it's not going to be just another crony capitalism deal, ultimately? Out of sight, out of mind, special interest will run the roost, that kind of a deal. Okay? These are all the choices that we as empowered voters and others have, and our leaders have to make. You know, ultimately, political accountability is up to us as uh, the electorate. All righty, moving right along. We need to move right along so we can save some minutes for the top hat questions. Uh, okay, name some firms, Microsoft, Apple, you know, firms like that that encourage innovation. Uh, I can't think of any right off the top of my head that don't encourage innovation, because I'm not sure, but uh, both, both sets are out there. Okay, I think we covered the second bullet already in our previous discussion. Okay, let's talk a little bit about natural monopoly. So here's a graph that describes a natural monopoly situation. See, we have the market demand up there. Can't read that. Let me go ahead and click it to slideshow mode. Okay, so the average total cost, sorry, I used an old graph that had ATC on there instead of AC. ATC and HC are the same thing. Uh, if the average total cost curve for one producer of the product hits bottom at or beyond the market demand for the good, probably doesn't make any sense to have more than one firm producing this. Right? Think of it this way. If we had two firms producing, hmm, trying to figure out a way, to, I forgot my laser pointer. You see where the AC and the market demand intersect? Okay, that quantity. Okay, if we had two firms producing that quantity, they would have to charge more than one firm producing that quantity because they'd have to meet their average cost, right, to stay in business. Okay, so if one firm produces that quantity where the market demand intersects the average total cost line, right, go over to the y-axis, that price is feasible. Right, covers expenses, normal profit, right? Price equals average cost. Okay, so this is an example with a graph of where it would cost society more to have two or more firms making that quantity. In fact, if you had two or more firms making that quantity, uh, they would both lose money, right? Because they wouldn't be able to sell it at the price they could get by on. Right, they, the price would have to be higher and then the quantity would be smaller. I'll go ahead and draw it up here. I still see some blank stairs, a lot of blank stairs. Okay, so here we go. All right, so if we had this quantity, we could have this price. All right, that price would P is equal to AC, right? Normal profit, cool. No incentive to leave, no, no incentive for anybody else to come in. If we had two or more firms, well then, all right, so we'd have half of Q, okay, at that price, okay, at that quantity, you'd have to have at least that price in order for each of the two firms to uh, survive, right, to cover their expenses and opportunity costs. So it's better just to have one firm and to regulate them to charge something in the neighborhood of price equals average cost. And I say that in the neighborhood of, well, Doc, can you be more specific? Yeah, in a minute, I will be. Okay, because there's some issues once you decide on exactly what price you want to regulate. If we regulate price equals average cost, we're still going to have a little bit of a deadweight loss. Because price equals marginal cost is where you get all the gains from trade. Go to the next graph on that. All right, so 
This is the one from the book. And you know that the marginal cost will equal the average cost at the average cost minimum. And so since the average cost is kind of flattening out, the MC will flatten out a little bit below it. So the optimal is where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost, where it says Q optimal. But what's going on at Q optimal? Hmm. At Q optimal, let's see, at that price, right, to get to Q optimal, you'd have to charge a price equal to where it says monopoly MC. And then price is less than average cost. Oops, a loss. Now you could have, oops, you could have a bunch of firms producing it. And see, then you have those little bowl-shaped average cost lines for a bunch of firms producing the product, and you'd have to charge a lot more, just like my graph down here in the lower, your lower left. Okay, so we don't want that. We'd rather have the price be lowered to everybody in more quantity. So yeah, that's a natural monopoly. But then we don't want them to act like a monopoly, which they would do. They have the Q monopoly would be Q sub M, and then they would charge P sub M. That's better than P sub C, but it's still way above opportunity cost. So through regulation, we can do even better. We can either decide to be simple about it and mandate <laughs> mandate uh, a price that yields a normal profit, price equals average cost. Or there's a way to have the efficient price and still not lose money, and that would be what are called access charges. Let me go on a couple more slides here. Uh, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. No, that monopoly, well, Walmart's not. Well, I guess in a small community, in a way, they could be thought of as a natural monopoly because they can provide the whole community everything cheaper than a bunch of little tiny business, if that's what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, in some cases, Walmart has, yeah, drive through Pecos, Texas sometime, and you see a Walmart at the south end of town in the downtown that's kind of empty. All the business has shifted down to, uh, the people complaining about it are shopping at Walmart. Right, because it's cheaper, right? They, everybody getting their goods and services as cheaply as possible. Uh, okay. Okay, so why are some things natural monopolies before we get into the access charges and how to regulate natural monopolies? High fixed costs. That's what yields that situation. High fixed costs are what cause you to have high initial costs per unit. Right? If you have to build a whole network and you have one customer, well, that's going to cost a lot right? to have one customer to serve up. But if you have a gazillion customers, right, you can spread those costs over a lot of people, right? and then you have low cost per unit. Right? The average cost will go down, 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 up to a fairly large quantity. All right, so high fixed costs are the main reason that there are natural monopolies like telephone service, which used to be a natural monopoly, no longer is, because now it's easier to move that data along, but some things still are like electrical, electricity transmission, city water, those are typically still natural monopolies. Okay, so now here we get into uh, the different alternatives to avoid P sub M in that graph, the monopoly price that yields the deadweight loss and the large economic profit. One is set the price equal to marginal cost, but as you see from put the marginal cost in here, so this is average cost. It's kind of a pain to go back and forth between slides. Here's the demand, okay, and the marginal cost would be doing something like this. Okay, go right through the minimum there. Okay, so here's our two alternatives. P is equal to, oops, nope, that's not the right one. Yeah, it is. Okay, so that would be P sub AC, and then, okay, so we could set price equal to marginal cost and have a really low price, but if we did that, okay, then the difference between point A and point B is the average loss per unit. Average cost is above price. So what can we do? Avoid with an access charge. What does that mean? 
Look at your SAWS bill sometime. I'm not saying this is why the SAWS does this, because they're owned by the public. They're not trying to maximize profit. But look at your San Antonio water system bill sometime. It has a meter fee on it. That's what we mean by an access charge. You get charged a certain amount per month, no matter how much water you use. Okay? Whether you go on vacation the whole month, you're going to pay that meter fee. Right? The right to have access to the service. And then, of course, on top of that, you pay more the more water you use. Okay? But if you, you can take this quantity here, this quantity of dollars in this case, and you can offset that by an access fee. Let's just, without putting more numbers up here, let's say that this shaded area is What's the monthly access fee? Let's say you have 100 customers to charge, to serve. What's the monthly access fee to be able to adopt the efficient marginal cost equals price policy and not have economic losses? 100 customers. Monthly access fee. See, these are the kind of things that people in business, okay, economists included, but people just trying to run a business, these are the kinds of computations that they have to make without somebody telling them what they are. They have to be able to think it through on their own, their due diligence to figure out what to do and what not to do. Okay, 100 customers paying a monthly access fee has to make up for otherwise losing a million dollars. I can see who the students are and who the stenographers are. So, oh, he'll figure it out. He'll put it up on the board. I'll write it down. And then somehow, by magic, I will figure out how to do it on my own between now and Tuesday. Really, it works better if you give it your best shot. OK, I couldn't figure it out. Something didn't work. But give it, you know, really get those wheels turning and try to, try to do it and then succeed or fail. You get really excited when you succeed. Whoa, I figured that out on my, by, on my own. Man, I must be learning something. Whew, getting something for my money and all the time I've spent here other than having to memorize something that I don't understand. Okay, 100 customers billed monthly for a year have to make up a million dollars. It's not that hard of a math problem. It's not the hardest word problem you've ever done. Yes, Eric? Uh, huh? huh? I don't know. I just made, up the, made it up. You, that, that could be in the neighborhood. But I know what to do. Let's see. So we're going to have 100 customers, and each one of them are going to get 12 bills, right? 12 monthly bills. Okay, so 1,200. Divide a million by 1,200. Right, we've got to collect a million dollars. So each one, each one of the 100, divide a million by 100. How much is that? Okay, move the zero over a couple, that's what? Huh? $10,000, right? And then times, I think, I think you might be, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I think 833 was right. <laughs> you were right, you didn't know it. Right? Each one of them's got to come, got to pay 10,000, right? A million dollars over 100 people, right? But once a month, so 10,000 divided by 12. Well, as long as you know what you did. Okay, not a hard math problem, but yeah, you do have to get the wheels turning. Okay, okay 100 people, yeah, each $10,000. Oh, in 12 monthly segments, oh. 10,000 divided by 12. <clears throat> okay, so if we collect the million dollars through the access fee, then by charging price equals marginal cost, we have no deadweight loss and the firm makes a normal, economic, normal profit. Okay, a normal economic profit, a profit of zero after opportunity cost, a normal rate of return. Now, the other alternative is just to say that's complicated, you know, and plus things change and the demand moves, and if we don't figure out exactly what the right access fee is, you know, they'll lose money and then they'll quit and then we won't have anybody producing this product. Or if we set the access fee too high, then they'll uh, be shaking people down and charging them money for not actually doing anything. So yeah, maybe we would do something more simple and then we would set the price at P is equal to AC, okay, where the demand hits the average cost line, okay, right here. See, but why is there a deadweight loss still if we do that? See, if we set the price where it says P sub AC over here, 
we have this dead weight loss. Not huge, you know, but there you go. Right, from Q prime all the way over to, didn't label this other quantity here, right, over to the efficient quantity, right, the additional stuff is worth more than it costs to provide the additional stuff. A little bit of a dead weight loss. All right, so you can go for the gold, so to speak, okay, by trying the more complicated P is equal to MC plus access fee root. Or you can say, eh, close enough, P is equal to AC, keep it simple. A little bit of inefficiency, eh. Okay, so there's your policy trade-off. Okay, and there it is written up there, right? This regulation will allow the firm to break even, but will not completely eliminate the dead weight loss. There it is. Question, comment, thought. Ah, okay, so here's another graph that kind of gets into that. There you go. You see, if, you, if my graph there, which is looking pretty ugly, and for some of you kind of long distance, there's the equivalent graph. That red bar is what you'd have to cover with the access fee in order for the P is equal to MC efficient policy to be viable. Viable means the firm won't say, hey, I'm out of here, I quit, because I can't cover my opportunity costs. Okay, and so then there's the alternative there of, eh, it's just simpler just to set price equal to average cost. A couple of things here at the end. We'll spend a couple of minutes here and then we'll go on to the top hat questions. Maybe you, maybe you always wondered, well, how are the Spurs and the Cowboys and the, and the uh, Houston Texans and the, whoever, the New Orleans Saints, how are they raise prices every year? Well, let's see, the stadium isn't getting any bigger, right? And every year there's more people and higher per capita income Right? The demand keeps shifting to the right. Okay? So the only way to ration out what's available is to keep charging more. There's a barrier to entry, right? The, the higher price can't suddenly induce another football team to enter the market. Okay? Well, I mean, that's what works in a regular market is the price goes up, profits are starting to be made and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then other firms say, I can do that, and they enter the market, and that drives the price back down. That doesn't work for the uh, major league and NFL and NBA. Uh, I'm doing marginal analysis. I think it's time to forego some of this stuff here because we have 20 minutes left to do 12 top hat questions. So, uh, okay, some of this is just a, it's just review. So we'll just uh, call it there. Oh, here's the list. Okay, so let's uh, put that up there. See, there's the list of things that yield monopoly power. Number one, translation, crony capitalism. Now, it's true, with economies of scale, it also takes government action. Okay? But, but there, the government action is supposedly benign in that, hey, it's cheaper to produce this product with one firm versus two or more. So let's take advantage of that fact and just regulate price in order to keep them from making monopoly profit. Okay, and then the other, uh, uh, the other two are, we just, well, we didn't discuss number three at all, but except mentioning Alcoa as an example, aluminum company had the bauxite all tied up. All right, let's uh, move on to the uh, top hat stuff. Oops, there. Okay, get those devices fired up, and if you didn't bring them, at least uh, pay close attention here and be assertive. Oops. Now, forgive me for being a little bit aggressive and going through these time-wise, but I can't wait till every last one of you is going to we'll get through as many questions. So, again, marginal benefit versus marginal cost. Try to be swift. Hmm. 
All right, so what all business firms have in common, competitive or otherwise, is that profits are maximized with marginal revenue equal marginal cost, or I couldn't find a symbol in the computer to have put the little thing above the equal sign. If I had, I would have put it in there that way. All right, not exactly equal in some cases. All right, let's go up here and see how many, how many are still crashing and burning on some things. Uh, no. Now the first one, again, I'm trying to fish for questions here. Maybe you want to fess up and say why you picked the first one and what I can do to explain it so that you won't do it again. Uh, price equals average cost means zero economic profit. So this notion of maximizing normal profit is an exercise in using familiar terms to speak nonsense. Right, maximizing normal profit, that doesn't mean anything. Because normal profit means profit is zero. Maximizing zero, what does that mean now? Okay, so, Paul. Oh, why didn't I or did I? Oh, it's just a convention. Economists, uh, you know, love the Greek, Greek alphabet, and and the letter P in the regular alphabet was taken by price. So that's just uh, what you see in books for profit. All right, moving right along to the next one. Each time you get one of these wrong, think beyond that and kind of try to go to why did it go wrong? Oh, the phone number? Okay. All right, we're up to a respectable level there. Okay, price maker means that you treat the demand line like a menu, a menu of price quantity combinations, preferring the one that maximizes profit. And okay, the one, as you march down the demand line, and increase quantity, the point at which additional quantity and lower price doesn't yield any additional profit. All right, let's see what we did. EGAD, okay, well, all of the above, they decide that what no. Uh, Congress doesn't set their prices. So, and they decide, no. Uh, price maker, I mean, there aren't competitive firms, right? Monopolies don't decide whether their firms can charge. So, anybody want to fess up on why they thought more than the first one was attractive and went for all of the above? All right. All right, here we go with the uh, table of numbers. Remember, you can click on the numbers. See them bigger. Yes. Okay, now if this, this one either, you either know it in a couple of seconds or you don't know it. Okay, so that's, tell, tell you something here on this one. Now there's no way to tell from those numbers that the numbers are for competitive firm or any other thing. Well, we've used numbers like this to compare competitive firms to monopoly situations. The only thing you can tell is that it's for the short run and you can tell that instantaneously or not at all depending on whether you recognize it or not. The reason you can tell it's for the short run is because the, for the quantity zero, there was a cost. 
the total cost was more than zero at a quantity of zero for you. So for sure, it's the short run. Doesn't, you, you, you know, the table doesn't describe an equilibrium. Now, you, you can use the table to find the equilibrium. Maybe that's what you thought I meant. Okay, in fact, we will do that here in a moment. Let's see how we did. Ah. Egad. All right, well, got that out of your system. Bravo, top hat, right? Again, discussion. Okay, not memorization, but discussion on why we thought it was a monopolist or competitive firm or whatever, and why it's not. Not a soul wants to fess up. But well, remember, we use the numbers to say, if it's a monopoly, this will happen. If it's not a monopoly, something different will happen. So the numbers are for an industry. Yeah, that means you're in the short run. Because in the long run, there aren't any costs if you produce nothing. It would be like saying, what would it be my expense to be an accountant in the long run? Zero, because I wouldn't be an accountant. Unqualified. All right, well, we better move on. Perhaps later you'll fess up online and I'll have a little discussion for them. Okay, just as when we use this up on the overhead, assume that the TR and MR are for the market as a whole. Stretch or a question? I feel the same way. <laughs> Popping noise there. Fun never ends unless you let it. Okay, good enough. We'll have to move on. Let's see, there's 71 is the answer. So how do we know it's 71? At any price above 71, the price, say 76, is above more than above marginal cost, and therefore expansion will occur. Or as they'll be saying in Louisiana, expansion. Okay, so let's say price is 76, quantity 12. At that quantity, the firm making marginal revenue of 76, right? Price equals marginal revenue, marginal revenue equals price. Marginal cost is 65, and the quantity is 12. Each firm will see that and say, oh, I should be making more. And when they make, all make more, the price will fall to the next level, 71, and they're just barely above marginal cost, they'll stop. If they make more than, uh, collectively make more than 13, the price of 66 will be their marginal revenue, and their marginal cost will be 75, and they'll say, no, that was a bad move, produce less. So they'll zero in on producing 13 at a price of 71. The thing I hate about Top Hat is it makes me feel so inadequate. <laughs> Look at these numbers like, uh, they're not getting it. Or uh, anyway, maybe it takes a while to get it, some study after the lecture and all that. But ouch, right? What made you think it was 91? Let's go back to the numbers here. Ah, see, but the marginal, yeah, that's what I was going to have a look at there. See, at 91, you're thinking, okay, marginal revenue. Uh, I'm sorry, nine, quantity 9, where the price is 91. Marginal revenue, 51. Marginal cost is up. But 51, that's for the whole market, not for a single firm, unless there is only one firm. See, the question here was it competitive. There's many firms. So the change in the marginal revenue, the change in the total revenue, the marginal revenue for the market as a whole, is not meaningful to any of the firms. For each firm, their marginal revenue is equal to the market price. So if the, if the market price is 91, 
then the marginal revenue to each firm is 91. Okay, and then compare that to marginal cost at 50. See, they're gonna all gonna expand and eventually get all the way down here to quantity 13, price 71. Yes? So if the question was asking for a single firm, would you go off the marginal cost of marginal revenue? Stay tuned. <laughs> There you go. Give it your best shot first, and then I'll uh, definitely answer your question. See, if there's only one seller, then they're the whole market. Then that market total revenue is that one firm's total revenue. Okay, this is one that either is going to go fast or not. There's not a lot of calculating to do here. So, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. And that's why the answer is 91. Okay, so previous answer. Okay, so by these two last questions now, you've made that separation, right, between the competitive and the monopoly. Now they're different. Yes. Okay. All right. The two last columns now are for that one firm, okay, the TR and the MR. Okay, so by this rule, which you can verify up here just by comparing total revenue and total cost and seeing where the difference is biggest, by this rule, we go down the MR and MC columns, kind of like making the lines intersect. Okay, wouldn't be a bad idea for you all to graph these numbers. You'll create a graph that looks like that one over there on the left. All right, that creates a comfort zone. Like how you've seen the graphs now, Craft and oh, it's the same thing. Oh, yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, so you go down the MR. You didn't use the MR line for the competitive, right? Because it was the marginal revenue for the whole market, not for individual firms, if there's many of them. Okay, but now that there's only one, yeah, that is the marginal revenue of that one firm. So you go down the MR and the MC column, and oh, that 9, 51 versus 50, almost exactly the same, right? So, you know, with the little squiggly thing here, just barely greater than. Right, if you went to the next one, if you went to 10, right, if you lowered your price to 86 to sell 10 instead of 9, the additional revenue would be $41 and the additional cost would be 55. No go. Okay, so you stick to the quantity 9, price of 91. Okay, is the monopoly quantity. Alrighty. Same numbers. Again, this one shouldn't take you long. If you're struggling with it, that in itself tells you something. If you know what to do pretty quick, it's telling you something too. Good. If you're yawning, that's even better. Right? Looking, oh yeah, easy. <laughs> Oh, you just, you know, bingo, done. Not yawning because you didn't get enough sleep, but yawning because like, oh, duh. Now, there's two ways to do it, given the numbers you have here. And again, as you look at it, if you get it wrong, what was it about the question? Was it a terminology? You didn't know what that word meant? Those are things to plant in your brain, think, oh, well, I needed to have done X to, you know, read that cheap better, ask some question, and then I wouldn't have gotten this term fuzzy. All right, time is running short. I may have to cut this off here pretty quick. So, all right, so 414, what are the two ways to do this? 
Oh, where'd that come from? Oh. Ha! Huh. I pushed the wrong button in inserting a graph here. Sorry, let me go back to... Uh, uh. You know, when, you, when you're uploading these, you have to click on a file. I clicked on the wrong one. Sorry about that. Let me, uh, let me go back to the previous one and show you why it's... Uh, maybe the next one will do. Okay, so... Hopefully, I, yeah, we're back to the right numbers there. Let me uh, disable submissions here first on this one just so we can use the graph. Okay, so what's the maximum profit? Back to the numbers that we were supposed to use. And before I send these, num these over to you, I will fix that on that other question before I put these all in your file. All right, so we already know the right quantity is 9. We already know the right price. Okay, and that's 91, right? So I'll just stick it in here. 9 times 91 minus what's the average cost and the quantity is 9. 45, okay, nice round number. So 91 minus 45 is 46. 46 times 9 is the 414 answer. Okay, and the other way you could have done it, just directly TR minus TC. Do both, as Deion Sanders said to Jerry Jones when getting, trying to get his contract finalized. Deion, should I put in there the $10 million bonus or the higher salary? Both, boss, both. Old Pizza Hut commercial. Anyway. TR minus TC is the same thing as, right, you know, as this. Verification. Do it both ways and see it. Seeing is believing. It builds confidence. All right, better move on. All right, so let's go ahead and do this one that I have up here in order to have the graph. There we go. Oh, we're going to run out of time. Oh, well. I will send you all of the questions even after we run out of time so you can have them to study from. So you got the learning curve, you have your top hat questions, then you can get after the homework, and then the homework, and you get ready for the test. Oh, keep in mind the homework this week, if I remember correctly, is due Saturday night at a, at a couple minutes before 10, not Sunday midnight. And don't forget that. Why? So you have time to study this stuff from chapter 13 between uh, Saturday night and Tuesday, Tuesday morning. That, yeah, that's why it's a day earlier. All right, let's see how we're doing on this one before we call it a day. Okay, so the dead weight loss is, how do you find the dead weight loss from a bunch of numbers? Same way you find it from a graph, same thing. Okay, at the equilibrium with the monopoly, the place you don't want to be, the inefficient quantity, which is nine, the marginal benefit is in the same price is the same thing as 91. The marginal cost is 50. Yeah. Okay. If you come up to this question on the test, take the five seconds that it takes to quickly sketch this graph out. Okay. 91 minus 45, 46 times this difference, 13 minus 9. Right, you had the 13 from a couple of questions previous. 13 minus 9 is 4. 4 times 46 divided by 2 is, oh, I'm sorry, not 46, 41 is 82. Okay. Chalk. again. Yep, if you got to go off to another class and got to run, do it. Okay, all the dead weight losses are the same. Where you are versus where you should be, 13 minus 9. And where you shouldn't be, in this case the 9, Marginal benefit versus marginal cost, 91 minus 50. Remember, you've finished studying when you're going, duh. Yes, let me, uh, 